Hi everyone, I'm Hayden Baggett, one of the programmers for the South by Southwest Conference. Welcome to the South by Southwest Sessions Online series. Today I'd like to introduce New York Magazine senior art critic and best-selling author Jerry Saltz, who will be in conversation with David Haskell, the editor-in-chief of the New York Magazine. In this session, they will discuss Jerry's new book, How to Be an Artist, address the rapidly changing social climate, give advice to creatives, and explain how the creative process can thrive in the face of adversity. And now, let's welcome Jerry Saltz and David Haskell. Jerry Saltz. David Haskell. Hi, welcome to this. Hi, David. It's great to see you. You're doing an insanely great job at New York Magazine. We are having quite a season of um, just the most intense uh, living and then also journalism of, um, you know, of my life. Um, but I'm really happy to take a break here and talk to you. I truly am. I want to say to this um, crowd, uh, it just by way of introduction, um, I'm the editor of New York Magazine and I have really the, the, the honor of publishing Jerry. Um, Jerry is an art critic and he has written about his life as, a, as what he called a failed artist. And we can maybe get into that. But I, I just want to point out that um, Jerry is that rare thing, a superb critic who is himself also an artist. And, um, you know, I think it's just like an incredible, uh, privilege to be working along him as we try to see the world. And that's really what I want to talk about here with Jerry. I mean, we could talk about your life. We could talk about your terrific book. And uh, we could also talk about our quarantined existence. And we could talk about the news of the last week. There's so much going on. And I do think actually structuring it around um, your work in art criticism is, is really kind of interesting. I mean, one of the, to start, I'm just going to say that I picked up Jerry's book again recently, just now. And um, it's beautiful and it's, about, <laughs> and it's called how to be an artist. And I thought, you know, um, let's open to a random page and see if that helps start the conversation. And the number 28 uh, directive was to look hard, look openly. And so Jerry, let me just ask you, what are you seeing? How do you see right now? Where are you and what are you seeing? Well, thank you for the introduction, David, really. Um, we're seeing, like you alluded to, the stories of our lives unfolding in real time outside of our worlds and inside of every one of us, of sp time speeded up, of change in the offing, change that as everyone in this country, if not the world knows, has been coming a long, long time and is now here. For most of us, it began not, I mean, the immediate part began 75, 85 days ago when all, everything we knew seemed to shut down and we were thrown upon ourselves again and then as we were thrown upon ourselves again, ourselves threw upon us too. One thing I'm seeing, David, and I've loved the photos in our magazine is there's a kind of explosion of first person photography. I don't mean artsy fartsy, you know, smoke and mirrors, photography about photography, you know, up its own butt, but Unbelievable recording, and you've been seeing that too, I assume. Yeah, I'm, well, you know, in part because there's extraordinary images to make, and and some of that comes from the just experience of lockdown, and you know that none of us thought was imaginable, and then suddenly it is, and and to document that is is extraordinary. But I think I've also seen, and I think you're you're alluding to this also, very quotidian daily life photography um, that's incredibly moving. How do you think, we're all amateur photographers, we're all constant photographers. Um, people must ask you all the time 
for, for advice about your what what should my relationship be to my phone we call it a phone but it's really a camera that sends text messages like i use it as a camera more than anything else how how sh should i be to use your you know how to be an artist how like what is the opportunity there this question is so fundamental to what's going on david because if you think about the rise of trump from say the escalator in 2015 through the first 18 months, his rise and MAGA was mostly covered by the networks. So most of the images that we have are very mediated from very particular points of view, uh, framed in special ways, usually pretty high quality, but they are from a point of view where I'm afraid that our photographers of the art world and most of the world were taking pictures instead of us, of our protest and our resistance. And suddenly you have this thing that is held in a different way. You can hold it like this, like this. It's a video camera. You're framing in different ways. You're seeing from different points of view. You're in different places. and the photographs are not photographs until they're embedded in social networks. So suddenly you have this infrastructure of reciprocity, of agency, of compassion, of comfort or, or rage. And it's fantastic. It's a change in photography that only later, I think will be seen that way. And I love the people's photography, as it were. It's tremendous stuff. It should be in museums, some of it. What, what, what do you hate about it? There might, what, 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 what do you not want to see another image of? Um, don't get overly symbolic. Never, everybody, ape the already journalistic, like, um, I like the pictures of somebody kneeling in front of a gun doing this, but you don't have to take that picture over and over. Every one of you is creative. Every one of you has a point of view. Every one of you may stumble upon, like the camera person that had his phone, camera running when the lights in the White House went off. Like, bam, out of nowhere, a new genre was born just like that. And it, it's quite extraordinary. And also I wanna never forget that much of this was triggered by one video after another video after another video, right? And now, so photography has, has had a part in this without getting too formal and arty. Yeah. And let's talk about um, just the experience of, I guess what we've been calling quarantine or self-isolation um, you got a lot of downtime. You've got a lot of close proximity. Um, some people with those that they truly have chosen, uh, but others with just forced proximity to family members and roommates and all of that. Um, and a lot of anxiety. And I wonder, and you know, oddly, your book was published right into all of that. And it, and it, arrives by mail and it says how to be an artist. And I bet a lot of people will thought, thought, well, this is a good time to explore that question and get some guidance. Um, what has been the dialogue that you've been having? I mean, I, the other thing I should say is that you are always in conversation with your readers, especially on, uh, as I see it on Instagram. Um, and I'm just curious what the kind of quarantine mood has done to the kind of artistic inclination. It's a big question on its most fundamental level, David, in many, many ways. Everyone listening to this in some way or another is thrown back to the conditions that we, our species came from. In the caves, creativity was there with us. Darwin never said it was um, survival of the fittest or strongest. He actually said it was the survival of those most able to adapt. Now, so all the people listening to this are probably making and doing things 
here and there's kids next to you and there's somebody cooking in the background and Nana is back there and the dog just ran in and your partner's on 17 Zoom meetings and these are the exact conditions that 99.9% .9 of all the things ever made in our culture were made in. That is when the studio, the office, the bedroom, the temple, the pharmacy, the kitchen, the nursery, they were all one small room. And people were making things out of hand or at what, what's at hand and smaller, probably not in big factory settings. I wanna give a big shout out to my editors who when this first started, they asked me to start doing those great lists of uh, you know, shows you can see online or old videos. And I asked my editor, David Wallace Wells, who makes my work anything that's readable, if I could instead maybe, and this is important for other people, other people worrying about, oh my God, uh, is, is the subject matter and the content of right now in my work, is my work suddenly irrelevant? Here's what I would say to everybody. The content of right now, our moment, this life right now is in you. And so therefore it will be in your work. Right now is a chance to ask yourself, are there things I've been leaving out? Are there things that I haven't pushed harder on? Are there weird warblings beneath the surface of this material or this idea or an urgency that I've kind of let slide. That's what I tried to do. As soon as I went into lockdown and I asked my editor, I wanna write about some art I've been thinking about that's always been in there for me. Some oddities, some beauty, ideas of ugliness, rage, pain, and um, I've been writing harder than I ever can and more in contact with human beings online, of course, because that's the best way for me to communicate uh, than I ever have. So everybody to finish, <laughs> yeah. I, I would only say, question yourself, be really honest, look hard, look long at yourself. But don't worry about having to suddenly start drawing pictures of police or Trump. You're not, you're not illustrators. All of that horror and beauty will be in your work if you can find a way to channel it. Maybe we could take a minute about the, the most recent long piece you wrote for us that is an extension of this. So Jerry, um, word got back to me that Jerry wanted to write <laughs> at length about uh, his eating habits, which... Um, somehow might might be a way of writing about quarantine and somehow might be a way of writing about art and his relation to it and also somehow might be a way to write about some of the most formative and traumatic moments of Jerry's life and I really encourage you all to track it down and read it I think it was called uh, my appetites uh google it Jerry my appetites um but but help me, it was incredibly um, elegantly constructed and impressive and all that, but it was also very raw. And it felt to me like you were pushing yourself to a more emotionally difficult place um, beyond your kind of professional expertise. And yet it was also very much about your relationship to art. Um, how do you think people, how, let, let's talk about how you did that. And I'm interested in, in like the, the, the kind of like the dangers or the difficulties, because that kind of writing and, and expression in other art forms can also be maudlin or sloppy or just um, heartfelt, but kind of not come together. And where, where is the through line? In my quarantine, all the performative aspects of my particular life were stripped away from the outside. I visit 20 to 30 shows a week in New York at galleries and museums. 
I get to be recognized. People say mean or nice things to me. I live in public, that disappeared. And soon as I went in private, in quarantine with my wife, a very high risk category. She's had cancer for six years. She's doing great right now, but we're still in you know, treatment. In any event, out of nowhere, I started get, I got an email from David Wallace Wells saying, how are you eating? And I noticed nobody else was asked that except me. And I haven't made it a secret that my wife and I don't cook. I wanted to take this moment and travel both inside of myself and outside and see if I could tell my story of how I got to this quarantine in a way that might relate to everybody's demons speaking to them, the formative experiences, how I knew I wanted to write, it was never get maudlin, never say, you know, uh, set it up as a big lesson, never try to keep it a little bit funny and be as honest as I possibly could in it. And it seemed, and using food as, I know this makes no sense, as a through line, because that's one thing I was doing, not cooking all through this, so. And like, I know. walk us through your um, personal kind of art history canon. When you think of great work that wrestles with demons, um, you know, what comes to mind? This is really a big question because you could say Goya's Saturn devouring his children. That's a form of demonic possession. And yet it's a form of beauty. It's very complex, the same way that Francis Bacon might be raging against the uh, anti-homosexuality of the Catholic church and all churches and all authorities. And yet his exploding popes and crazy scenes are painted beautifully. Same with the horrors of Bosch. On the other hand, you have somebody like Matisse who was making some of the most beautiful images of the early 20th century in what was he called? A wild beast, a fog. My personal canon has to do with artists expressing really deep personal visions of trying to be as original as possible and having things waiting for me in the work that's always been there. And that's what I've been looking for. I wrote on an old Bruegel painting called The Triumph of Death and uh, about a Celli painting. Uh, and what happens to you? How does a work that you've seen for years that you've stared at for hours suddenly reveal a, another layer of itself? I mean, I, I get that and have had that experience in other medium, but I haven't had it with the painting. And, and that just like viscerally, what does that feel like to you? What is the revelation? Wow, it hits me like a blast of fresh air. Like, can I remake Hamlet for myself? So I've now read Hamlet again. I haven't, uh, but I, let's just say you're looking at a painting you've seen before and you decide maybe you want to try to remake it and there's something in it that's so potent that you want to look more, harder, whatever. And you kind of create it for yourself and then you try to convince everybody else of it. I, there's no right answer to what's in a Van Gogh you know, or in a uh, all black painting by Malevich. I think I just give myself permission. That's what this book is about. Mm -hmm. It's about saying the minute you try to edit a magazine, write a text, do a stupid little dance for Instagram, post a poem on Twitter, uh, do a drawing of your Nana, because you can see she's just sitting over there you are going to be embarrassed, I promise you. I'm embarrassed right now as I'm speaking going, I'm not really making any sense and I'm talking to my big, big ass editor and now I have to be fired, but you've got to take that risk because if you don't, 
Now is a time that you are modeling yourself going forward. From this moment on, everybody listening, what's going on around you is going to keep happening, but yet it'll never happen quite this way again. And I want you to model for yourself and get off your asses, you big babies. Get to work. Even if you're in pain, that might be what's in your work or you have to make an enemy of envy, as I've written too. Mm -hmm. You have to stop looking at everybody else going, they have a better neck, they have a better education, this one has more money, that one has a better position. So what? We can't help you right now about that. But what you can do is make your work, write your letter to the world. And so much of what you're saying now and is in your book and also I think is is the um, is the way in which your eating habits are the perfect metaphor for all of this <laughs> this this combination of um, rigor and expression you know you want to be real what you're what you're doing telling the big baby go to work you're being hard on us and then you're also saying don't be hard on yourself open yourself up, be radically vulnerable. And um, both of those at high intensity seem to be the message of your book. But, but like, ha that's, a, that's a difficult thing um, to sort of navigate. Uh, how, do you, how do you talk to people who come up to you after a talk like this and say, yeah, I get it, but you don't understand. I am really bad. <laughs> like, that's nice of you to say, but trust me, if you saw it, you'd look away. Listen, there's never been a worse artist than Jackson Pollock. Have you ever seen his early drawings? They're worse than my drawings, even worse than yours. I, people, have no degrees. I went to no school. I was a Jewish long distance truck driver. I didn't start writing until I was 40 years old. I didn't start being an art critic until a, a, a working weekly art critic till I was 47. So if you want to see somebody that listen to the same demons that live in your mouth that tell you you're no good, well, here's what I would say. So what? You're no good. Jackson Pollock, uh, Vincent van Gogh, another completely self-taught artist, they willed themselves to find their own mark. And if you think that I, so let's say I take your advice, I will myself, and we check in a couple decades later, and I'm not van Gogh. I'm still not. Was it worth it? Yes. Because the question is, did you want to be a, an artist, a creative person? For me, a person is a success if they're making things. How big does your audience really have to be? Do you want a worldwide Beyonce size audience? That's going to be hard. And you have to understand the a successful artists that you all focus on, they only account for 1% of 1% of 1% of 1%. All the artists I know, the 99.9 .9 are really good artists, even if they're, listen, you might not be famous or rich, but you will have had a life lived in art and for me, that's a tremendous success where you didn't listen to the demons anymore. You made your shitty work. Look at my work. I do it online every day and I'm torn a, a thousand new ones every day and it hurts, but you cannot be defined by rejection. You have to just keep saying, but I'm compelled to do this. I have an inner asshole that lives in me. I try to keep him at bay. And unfortunately, sometimes he comes out too. But with the bad comes the great. So just All right, speak so your truth. Let, I, I uh, have some questions that have been uh, asked of you, Jerry, that I'm starting to scroll through. And I see the first one just as a natural extension of what we were talking about. So I'm going to start there. The question is um, how do you create when you don't feel excited by it or inspired by it? Do you just create anyway? 
So what about that inspiration question? I am not the first one that said work comes from work. I never want to work, ever. I just think I'm no good. I should just call in every morning and quit. But then because I'm a late bloomer, I put my butt in the chair and I get to work. 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Whoever asked this question, you will not have an opening for having your ghost occupy you to work through you as dumb inspiration if you're not working. You've got to get to work, you big babies. I love you, but that's the way it begins. So forget about inspiration, that every single second is a new inspiration and then you delete it and you start again until you end up with the last thing that it, it was. And then you hit send and that's fucking it, okay? Then you go to the next. Okay, here's another question um, that I, I uh, am excited to hear you answer. Um, in 2020, what makes an artist? Is it different than it was 10 years ago or even during the Renaissance? 85% of the art you all see when you go around to art galleries in whatever city you live in, it's crap. Of course, your 85% of crap and mine are different in those same galleries. However, I would tell you, questioner, that 85% of the work made in the Renaissance was crap also. We just never see it. What an artist is, we don't know. We know it's probably the most advanced operating system that our species has ever developed to explore consciousness, the unseen world, the seen world, the unconscious world, and all the problems that it's meant to address when they have all been addressed, that's when art will disappear. People in the art world are always trying to say the novel is dead, the, uh, the theater is dead, the image is dead. Excuse me, we started saying the author was dead as soon as women and artists of color showed up. It was like, oh, you mean we can't make art anymore because we're authors? It's always being reinvented, questioner. Being an artist changes all art was once contemporary art, as all artists are contemporary artists when they're working. It's not that different, but you better be working. Let's um, move to another subject that you have written a, a lot about over the years. Um, which is, has to do with the kind of the art market as distinct from art itself. So here's the question. What is the relationship between art and business? And how is the global pandemic and other social issues from the Black Lives Matter movement to climate action going to alter that? The art world that we left in America 77 days ago, in some ways it's already gone. Like so many things in this culture, all that happened was all of the fault lines were exposed. People started, these were things we all knew. What the were the fault lines? The fault lines were, we answered every question with the same answers, which were we got bigger or we got busier. The answers kept being on every art blog, what you would see is coverage over and over of the same 55 uh, fabulously successful, mostly white male artists and their amazing prices. I have nothing against money. I want good artists to make money, bad artists, and very bad. But I will say that none of that, honestly, looking back and we knew it or I kept writing it, had anything to do with the art at all. The price of something is irrelevant. It's what it's making you think about, what it's making you do, not and what is making you experience, not what it costs. Look, it was hard to go around the art world with that much money staring at you in the face 
every time. And look, prices are going to fall 30 to 50 percent. OK, uh, I'm guessing we'll lose about that many collectors. I'm guessing we'll lose about that many galleries. Performing art spaces, they're in deep, deep shit. Uh, going forward, it's a bit like I talked about earlier, building a different infrastructure of agency, of you know, comfort, of communality. Instead of all of it getting bigger, faster, more, and traveling to art fairs, when is the next time you're going to see 60-year-old collectors getting on plane to plane to plane to plane, uh, flying to art fairs? Or to finish this, uh, and why, how did we ever end up thinking it was normal? for a gallerist to fly to London for the night for an open. And yet it became normal. And this happened in every single world. And that's under change. And here's the good news, everybody. You who are listening to it, I may never gain immunity. Don't tell David Haskell this, but it's I don't know that I will ever gain any immunity to come back to society again. All of you, however, are being tasked with the most glorious thing on the face of the earth. I once built an art world in the 1990s with about a million other people. Maybe it was beautiful. It was great. It was made up of, of, of pirates and losers and people like ne'er-do-wells, complete people like you who had half mad and no place else to turn. And we made a beautiful world that then got bad. You are being tasked to build a new city and you will. Let's um, stay in your sort of memoiristic mode because I do think there's something exciting about the future looking perhaps like your first years in the in the art world and experiencing art there's a question here i see that is what is the best thing you learned at the chicago institute of art and what did you learn from leaving it i tried to go to the art institute of chicago when i was in my 20s i was once an artist but i let me be an example boys and girls of somebody that listened to the demons that told me, you don't know art history. Like David said, yeah, but my work is really bad. Well, I listened to all those voices and I was enraged that everybody with more money and uh, taller and better hair or sleeping with more people just like you. And I stopped being an artist. My little book, in a way is a note to my younger self from me, trying to tell that person, which is all of your stories, the things I learned since quitting that and all the lessons I've ever learned from all the artists I've ever met. And here's, I think, one of the most important. You have to show up, my loves. I am the most bad, you'll never believe this, I know. I am almost pathologically shy, okay? I won't pick up the phone if it rings in my house, if you want nutso. Um, the best thing for you to do is stay up late every night with other vampires, whether it's marching or sitting together, having the worst fight of your life, and then your best friends in the morning when you wake up whatever it takes, vampires have to be together to be kind of touching antenna and communing with each other. Those are the people you're going to take over the world with and you must protect each other at all costs. That's the most important thing, my loves, that and work, work, work. You've got to show up 
I know you're shy. I know you're scared. I know you think you are a loser. So what? We're all losers on this bus. Nobody gets out of here alive. So all you have to do is show up with your dumb work and you will find other people just like you and you'll take over the world. That's the most important thing and making an enemy of envy, of stopping looking out and being in the service of everybody else but yourself, of seeing what they have that you don't have, then, then we're going to have to get it for you. Here's a question that seems to be uh, quite popular. What's the best way to brainstorm remotely? How would you answer that? I think the minute we go remote, your brain is already storming. It's already going through things that you won't know sometimes until after the idiot Zoom meeting where you suddenly realize I had a good idea and then I let the demon tell me not to do it. I've had two of those in the last three weeks in a New York Magazine thing. I pitched a meeting right while David Haskell was talking and I got inspired and then I backed off, but then I figured out another way to get back in. All I can say about these brainstorming when we're in private is just keep fucking doing it. You have to be in contact with others of your own kind, my love. If you are only talking to, like, um, if you're made as a lawyer and you're a creative person, that's great. I hope they're supporting you. Um, but you need to be speaking to other people of your own kind. Don't worry. And what to do together, whatever you want to do is required. I promise you, there's no wrong answer. I've never, I've seen the biggest losers in the art world doing the right things every night. It's extraordinary. Well, so, you know, I think it's interesting, this question of communality and relationships, but also a very personal, private relationship with your own art. So, so you know, is the brainstorm about making group art or is the brainstorm not the right word for the com for the relationships that you're talking about. What what do you get from other people? I am an older person who works alone, and yet I can't write if writing is without you. I know this that if I'm only, as it were, cooking for myself and the only one eating my meal. All of you are so messed up, like all of us listening to this, that you need to dance naked in public, that you need feedback. And so I guess what I'm saying is you have to find a way to be with other people, but be your most own true self in your work. That is be listening, be willing to take criticism from your friends. That is worth its weight in platinum. Like I listen to my editors. I never take it personal, even though they like might X out a whole paragraph or five. Oh my God, my genius, it's gone. I don't have an answer for you other than I keep going back to you've got to just keep showing up, be with other people, Get quiet in yourself and remember, each one of us are like little preachers, okay? We are preaching our little gospel of how to save the world. Do you want a mega church? Maybe, but most of us are preaching to our own families, our own communities, our own say gallery of friends, my own magazine of my own family, of speaking to and learning from each other you will get, you can change the world. It's so easy. The tiniest galleries I've ever seen and the strangest people I've ever known have done little things that made the world look different. Think about Andy Warhol, who didn't even want to paint. And he turned 
the most good looking uh, by man uh, into the man that silk screened his work and Warhol just loved to watch. And he invented a new kind of paintbrush that way. You could try that. Do you, so was Warhol like, was he always an artist or did he learn to be an artist? Were you always an artist? Do you learn to be an artist? The question that I see here is, yeah, do you feel like you were born to be an artist or had to learn to be an artist? And from that question, I think is a lot of anxiety. Like, am I just in the wrong South by conversation and I'm actually just not an artist, I shouldn't be here? Or is there an opportunity to become something I don't feel confident that I currently am? They say that homosexuals and ventriloquists know what they are when they are very, very young. Okay. I think that all, any, if you're in this South by conversation, you know something that you've known for a long, long time. And you're afraid to be an example of it. And I would say, so what you're afraid? So what, you might be a bad ventriloquist, a bad artist, who's judging that? I mean, for God's sake, you can't prove that Vermeer is better than Norman Rockwell. It cannot be proved. Of course, if you like Norman Rockwell better, see me after the lecture. But in any event, honor the calling. Art uses us as a weird, weird vehicle to reproduce itself. If you just want to draw your dog or you like stripes, you will find a way to draw your dog in the way that only you do it. So when I look at David's dog drawing, I go, pretty bad drawing, but it's really David's. I've just called you a great artist. To me, you're a success. Your audience might only be a 15, but that's not bad. Okay, here's a question. Uh, do you have any fears or predictions of censorship? Yes, <laughs> and yes, and it doesn't matter. I think, I want to tell anybody that's curious, by now, I am a dying breed, meaning weekly critics that write for general interest publications. When I started, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands. Now there are probably nine in America. No one in this entire time has ever said, maybe you shouldn't write that negative review, Jerry. Never. Everybody always thinks, well, the editors don't allow them. That's bullshit. They will allow you to write what you think, if you can kind of not sound like an asshole too much. And it's up to the critic. As far as censorship goes, are there things that I want to say that I don't write? I'm sure, you know, I don't want to do name calling on people or overdo it on certain artists. And will I be censored? It's happened. And you know what I always say? Just listen. I just listen when people tell me that this might not have been right after Trump came down the escalator. In all honesty, I just thought I better shut up and start listening to people. And if I'm hurting them, I don't want to be part of that infrastructure. And what is censorship? What does that really mean? I'm not. Let's talk sure. about it also now in the context of censorship of art. I mean, you've seen uh, moments of intense political uh, pushback and um, just sort of like righteous fury around uh, art that scares parts of the country, parts of New York City. What is that, you know, back to fears and predictions, what do you think is most damaging about a situation like that? And where do you, where do, where do your fear thoughts take you? More than ever, I want to be aware of trying not to step outside of myself 
and try to represent somebody else. Is that censorship? I think it's just consciousness. And this time demands a very particular, not a particular, a pervasive consciousness of trying not to define somebody else. Does it mean that I, as a white critic, cannot write on a black artist? No, it doesn't mean that, but it better, it does mean that there are certain references, certain associations, certain histories that I'm, it might behoove me to know and not just subject it to one lens. So going forward, we will just continue, David, I think the project that was really underway during Obama, which was the complete rewriting of the canon which obviously, first of all, excluded 51% of the population as far as women. And then it, include, it excluded all artists for the history of the world of color. So it was the most exciting moment in my entire lifetime of art history and criticism as it was being rewritten. Will that end? Oh no, it's now accelerated and we're all in the balance now. This is changing. It's changing and we're not going back to the other art history. It doesn't mean, ladies and germs, that we're gonna throw out Michelangelo and Picasso because Picasso was an asshole, okay? He was, so what? I'm sorry. If you wanna throw him out and don't look at his work, that's okay with me. I think you're missing something, but it doesn't mean we're throwing out the entire canon. It means we're rewriting it. There's, a, there's an, a question that's bubbling up that brings us back to the question of audience. Um, how do we get our work seen by those who will find it most meaningful, reaching audiences we might not have access to, for example? And I know that you've said it can be dangerous to think about size of audience. But I think you're also very good at using, let's just, let's just use this question to get into Instagram because there is opportunity, extraordinary opportunity. And, and I think you're energized by it of finding, you know, the artist and the art finding the audience in different ways. And what is so electric to you about, I mean, to, to explain to the group here, Jerry often is using his Instagram account to surface work, very current work uh, of uh, art and satire and bringing his audience to that artist's work. How do you think about that curation? All of you have such a tool at your disposal. When I started being a critic, I knew right away that somehow the old model of the top of the one critic writing down to the many in a pyramid, that top down structure never worked for me. I, my voice is not authoritative that way. I don't think that way. I don't live that way. With Social media about 10 years ago, less maybe, I don't know. I suddenly realized that instead of the one speaking to the many, you could have the many speak to one another in a comprehensible way. Two, I think that the art world became so insular and so secret handshaky, and I was lucky to barge my way in as an older person to at least start watching what it looked like, even if they didn't want any piece of this, which I don't blame them. I've never been asked to write for sort of the art world school newspaper of art form, which I think is great. I never understand a word in there, but I do think it's a great magazine. I suddenly realized that out here, there's a lot of really good artists. And, David, all I did was make myself a hashtag archeologist. And so if I went to your page and saw a photo I liked and it had the name of the person, I might look at that, not like it, and then find another and go from there to another. And then I would post, it. all this took 10 seconds. All of you should be posting your work online, but not just your work, you big bores and not just plates of food and your dog, okay? Kids are great, 
but no, no dogs, okay? I, anyway, post your work, your friend's work, work that interests you, bizarre things that you see, that weird scene in the backyard. I hate to tell you, you have David Askell is a secret great fucking photographer. I love his pictures. I don't even like liking them because I think it looks like kissing up. So I would post and then meet the other people. And I haven't answered. I'm what they no, well, okay, So here's the question. So, so take us through an in, a recent hashtag archaeology rabbit hole. Like, how do you do that? You wake up and you think, huh, I wonder this would be an interesting hashtag to explore. What would you do recently? Well, if I wake up in the morning, like this morning, I woke up thinking, what images that could bring to mind for me, George Floyd? But I knew I did not want to see pictures of him or police beating on him. That I didn't want to see something literal. And I'm going to show you one that became, it will be world famous. I started just looking up his name, click, 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 but it took no time at all to end up with this beautiful image by uh, Titus Kapoor. It will be for Time Magazine, I guess, this week. The point I'm trying to say is I might look up medieval torture. I love medieval imagery because like our time, it was after the Roman Empire and before the hegemony of absolute pure Christianity and before it all blew up. And there were a million stories in a million spaces and they went through plague and horrors. And I might start there and then, and this is making no sense. I'm gonna to try to cut it off and just keep following the hashtag. So the, okay, the, keep following. So you start with medieval archeology. Okay, medieval. so I've now seen a picture of um, somebody being flayed alive. Okay. And then I get to Mantegna. Um, a great Italian artist. And I think, God, I love Mantegna. And I go to his page or a who is Mantegna. And then I look at that and I see a weird image and I touch that. And all of a sudden it's like a grotto that somebody found in Bulgaria of like a giant like exploding. I don't know. And that will be my image right there. I go, Wow, this kind of grabbed me. But more than that, I want everybody to know I do this with contemporary art all day. So you gigantic, terrible losers posting your unbelievably bad art, as bad as mine or his, it doesn't matter to me. I'm watching. And if I like your work just a little, I'll click on it. Maybe I won't grab it. But then you might have hashtagged somebody else I'll follow it there to your friend, to your other friend, to your friend. And then I just post it. I think that's such an important just clarification of your job, or at least how you see your job. I think often people think of critics as staring down everything and choosing, like narrowing it down to what's best um, and judgment. And it seems like you're you're driven so much by curiosity. Like what your Instagram feed is just an expression of what grabbed you um it's very sort of generative rather than than editing that's the word generative and i have to stand up for everybody out there i used to be on those top 100 power lists in the art world and it was fun and i remember one of them about seven years ago said Salt's the most popular art critic, and that's what I wanted to be. I never fashioned myself as like the smartest art critic. That's not of that much, in I don't know what that means. I wanted to be accessible to people. Do you know Sister Wendy was like that? Or Bob Ross was to painting, a folk critic for everybody. But when they wrote on me, they said, Salt's may be the most popular, but he risks all authority if he stay if he continues being a critic online and i just thought well of course i'm going to risk everything yeah, take the risk 
Yeah, it's more fun. Pleasure is an important form of knowledge, my loves. My wife taught me that about art. You may think you don't like figurative art or abstract art, and all of a sudden you see like some fuzzy rectangles by Mark Rothko, and you're crying like a big baby. And maybe just get quiet in yourself and say, huh, two little fuzzy rectangles just made me cry. What kind of art makes you cry? Why? Make a list of three of its qualities, then look at something you don't like, make a list of three of its qualities. That's all you have to do. All right, I think we, we should call this one the last question because it's kind of a big, big one or you could go big with it. Uh, how do you start an artistic movement? You don't, it's not possible. It's never been done. You listen. Name a movement, any movement. Van Gogh was the most famous artist alive in his lifetime. Every myth that you know about Van Gogh, not true. Every artist in Paris knew every single move. This nutty Dutchman who taught himself to draw was doing. All the post-impressionists that means Gauguin, Seurat, Van Gogh, the artists that you know their names. They knew one thing, and that word was never used in their lifetime. They never heard the word post-impressionist. They knew one thing, that impressionism was boring, 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 and that they wanted to make paint even more uh, vibrant or color more intense and not have it be so like Monet, he's great, but just make your own work, find other vampires of your own kind and you will begin without even knowing it. Matisse went to Picasso's studio to see a brand new painting called Les Demoiselles and I'll finish with this. He hated it. It was Picasso's most famous painting. But when he left, he, he said, it's very cubistic. He's the first person to ever use the term. Don't try to create a movement, just make your work. Creating a movement, bad way to think. All right, Jerry. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and for all of your writing and work. And uh, I encourage everybody who's, I don't know, on the, I, I can't imagine you're listening to this and haven't already bought the book, but if you're on the fence, Please. buy the book. Get, <laughs> get the book for your mother-in-law also. <laughs> I bet she'll like it. Um, there's a lot of graduations coming up, et cetera, et cetera. But um, anyway, thank you again. And, and um, thank you to South by Southwest for hosting us. Hayden, I'm gonna throw it back to you uh, right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, South by Southwest. <laughs>